Today's episode of Market Talk is brought to you by Growmark FS. Keeping up on the latest in ag is a challenge, to say the least. But there are experts nearby ready to help. You'll find them at your local FS. You can trust them to bring you customized agronomic, grain, and energy solutions born of the latest thinking. That's because FS specialists receive continuous training that keeps them current on the latest trends, practices, and technologies. So you'll get local expertise that's both exceptional and up-to-date. Visit FSSystem.com to learn how FS is bringing you what's next. And joining us here today with market analysis, a big, big day on Thursday with the USDA reports, a slew of data out into the market. We had economic reports out Thursday morning as well. And overall, fairly positive reaction, at least in the grains and oil seeds, when it was all said and done on Thursday. Joining us, Christy Van On, she's at Van On and Company. Christy, happy new year to you. Great to have you back on the show. You too. It's great. Well, Christy, let's jump right in and talk about what we saw on Thursday. And uh, we were talking before we jumped on air. So many surprises from USDA. Um, I don't even know where to start. So I will, um, I guess, just looking at this thing as a whole, I I mean, overall, we could go a bunch of different ways. But those ending stocks numbers, I, I think that had to be one of the biggest surprises we saw on Thursday when it was all said and done, Christy. Yeah, it's, you know, this is what makes my job fun is that every day can be a little bit different. And today's one of those opportunities that you got a lot of information to digest. And you're exactly right. When you look down at carryout levels of of where we are, you came into this report, everyone expecting to see slight increases in carryout levels. You know, that was across the board. You really thought you would see that. And what we ended up getting was slight decreases. And it wasn't so much that it was a huge number change. It was mostly the fact that like you just had a lot of people wrong. Like a lot of people had guessed this market wrong, had anticipated to see uh, higher carryouts. And we could see that. We could see that coming into this report with the sell-off that we've seen in wheat, with the sell-off that we've seen in corn. We're 35 cents off um, the recent high in, in the corn market. And so I think you just really started to see that. And the more you digested into these numbers, the more you kind of saw that there was friendly tidbits kind of sprinkled everywhere um, for a lot of these markets, not so much for wheat. Um, but when you look at corn and beans, you had some really friendly numbers in there. And so if we wanted to you know, break it down and start with corn, one of the things looking at corn is um, right away, I noticed that they increased uh, the yield of a bushel. Um, mm-hmm. And I was like, what in the world are they doing? But I also noticed that they took harvested acres down. Uh, I think it was 1.6 uh, million acres of harvested uh, down. And so when you ended up coming with it, you ended up seeing uh, a net decrease in production uh, and giving it that that friendly characteristic. And then what you ended up seeing below that was that to keep carryout levels somewhat similar to where we've been in the past, they ended up cutting 185 million bushel of demand uh, month over month to kind of offset some of that change. But we still saw that net decrease. And, you know, they took 150 million bushels away from exports. That does not surprise me. You know, Mm -hmm. our exports have been lacking. Hopefully we can see them start to pick up. Uh, You've had some friendly rhetoric around the talks between Mexico and the U.S. about their GMO policies and Mexico has kind of pushed it off. And so I hope that you can see that because Mexico has been one of our top corn buyers, you know, for the last few years, besides this uh, change of pace from China. Uh, So that doesn't surprise me, but you also saw feed use drop 25 million bushel. And that one kind of surprised me because when you look at it, feed use is over 400 million bushel lower year over year. And we know that we have herd reduction. We know that we're battling that. But you might be looking at it and saying, is USDA kind of thinking possibly the poultry side of things might be more of an issue moving forward with bird flu? Are you seeing that kind of change the pace? But overall, what we do know in both corn and soybeans is USDA had to cut a lot of demand to keep carryouts from being drastically lower. And so mm-hmm. when you look at the comparison of corn demand year over year, I mean, we're over a billion bushel less corn demand than we were a year ago. Now, you know that a lot of that's going to be taken out of feed and a lot of that's taken out of exports due to China just not being as active. But you look at it and you kind of see that dynamic. Um, We really have to scale back on the demand side moving forward over the next four to six months um, or you're going to have a much different situation. So 
the the supply and demand side of things, the carryout levels itself, when you look at that number are overly friendly, it's what they had to do to get to that number that give you the friendly atmosphere and kind of that same situation when you look at soybeans. Mm -hmm. uh, soybeans ended up coming in here, uh, dropping harvested acres, dropping your bushels um, and coming down and, and dropping 55 million bushel of export demand off of soybeans. And that one caught me off guard because we have been actually doing fairly well on our export pace. And my logic, the logic I can think of is that you potentially could be coming in here and saying, hey, OK, we know that Brazil is going to have a good crop. We're going to lose some demand because Brazil is going to take away those soybeans. And that might be the case. But overall, we have been keeping up with our export pace and we've been keeping up with our shipment pace. Right. Mm -hmm. When you look at where we are for exports inspections that come out every Monday, we are getting these soybeans out the door, which means that number is not going to change. So that one caught me off a little bit, you know, I, it caught me off guard. And when you look at it, if they hadn't have made that change, you would have been looking at a carryout level well into, you know, 175 million bushel area. And mm -hmm. so you look at those numbers and the carryout levels aren't all that like eye opening until you dig into what USDA did to get them there. Always feels like they find a way to massage these numbers to make yeah. them work for lack of a, a better way right. to explain that. They just they, they find a way, it seems, to make them work somehow, some way. And, and I would say, obviously, beans and, and especially old crop corn, uh, really a good bullish reaction to the reports, the entire soy complex for that matter. So I, I guess with quarter beans, I'll save wheat here for a minute. Let's let's look at this overall now that we have these numbers out, what what in your mind changes or doesn't change risk management wise? If I got cord beans, if I'm holding on to old crop right now, if I'm thinking about new crop sales, does anything change with I'm with my mindset right now? Yeah, the way I look at it right now, we'll start with corn. Is that corn has found itself a very decent range? Like it's found that six or yeah, six fifty wants to hold. It's found that six eighty seems to be that like top level of resistance. And so you're essentially in a thirty cent range right now into the corn market. And until it can break out of that range, I'm I'm really just letting it work, right? You need cash flow purposes. I have no problem selling corn here. Um, if it breaks out of 680, I would probably look at buying it back. Uh, if it doesn't, you know, I'm not in a rush to buy it back right now. And I think you've, you've really done a great job the corn market has defining this range and saying this is where kind of we get some selling pressure this is where buyers want to stop in we got just below 650 here this morning prior to the report and so i don't think it changes a whole lot i same situation for a new crop corn it's really found its range in between that 590 seems to be a huge level of of support for them and so until it can prove itself, um, I'm going to just let it be right. Um, and I think, you know, for the most part, it's proving that, you know, soybeans are a little bit of a different situation. Soybeans, you look at that $15 mark and it's really been that psychological level of resistance that we struggled to get through. Um, we are through that now. Um, and so now you need to look at it and you need to say, hey, OK, we're, we're through that. 1520 is another level, um, you know, not a psych level, but a, a technical target that seems to be holding this market in check. We got through it today, ended up closing below it. And so those are kind of the levels that I'm watching. You know, we want to be 100% sold in, in old crop soybeans right now. But the producers that I have that don't want to be there, I'm not fighting them on it. And what I'm saying is watch $15, right? It took a, it took quite a bit to get through 15 now that we're through it, let's let it be a support shelf. Let's see if we hold on to $15. If we break below $15, let's sell the rest of those beans. I'm willing to risk that 18 cents that we really have between where we are now and $15 to see if this market can make something of itself. What we've seen so far is that the rallies are limited right now when you look at these markets they want to get up and going they have the fundamental backing to say hey you know we have some tight situations they have the seasonal backing to say this is a great seasonal time frame to get up and running but there's just something missing and part of that might be managed money not being as active not being those big buyers but there's something missing when you look at this market to get up and going. So until we can get through, I like to use the term like cautiously optimistic. And I feel mm -hmm. like people like to like judge me on that and say, hey, you're just like kind of <laughs> flirting the line. But until it can show me that it can get through those levels, I'm going to just let it be and let it rest and let it carve out of that range. 
South American weather too. I have to feel like that's going to become the headline once again here. I know we had the Argentine production cuts from USDA following the Rosario grain exchange cuts. So I know that's a situation that bears watching and feels like that's going to be the probably the big driver now that we've got the reports from USDA out and digested into the trade. Right. Yeah. So every year, or it seems like at least the last few years, you've had that story east versus west in the U.S. And mm -hmm. we're starting to get that story again here in South America, where it's Argentina against Brazil. And you're starting to see those aggressive cuts come into Argentina. And you're starting to see the production slowly increase in Brazil. And what we know from previous, previous times is that people are quick to cut production, but slow to give it back and slow to increase production. And so we need to see that relationship between the two. And in the end of it, you know, can you see Brazil make up for what Argentina is missing? That could possibly be the story. But the bigger story is there are two different beasts, right? Brazil is going to be our competitor for exports. And you're going to see Argentina be the issues that you have is going to be byproduct, more meal driven rallies. And we've seen that when soybeans have fallen off recently, meal has still been able to hang on. And so it's a much different dynamic between the two. You like to relate them, but they really are completely different situations. And so I think that is the biggest thorn in soybean side right now is the fact that Brazil, who's a direct competitor with us for exports, is having a good crop year. And this is your first time that you've seen people start to acknowledge it and start to increase those production levels. You know, oddly enough, you did see a decrease in production here um, from USDA for Brazil corn. That's a ways off, right? We have a long time before we're going to start talking about Safrina corn crop. Um, but you do have good conditions in Brazil. You have good rains coming for them. And you have the potential to have a big crop being able to be planted here for the Safrina corn crop. So I did feel like those cuts were a little uh, premature, but you have a lot to give yet when you look at that dynamic. And there's a lot of unknowns when you look at Brazil, like everything on paper looks good. We've had some, some dry patches, mm -hmm. but for the most part, you've had that. When you move forward, we're going to start getting real yield estimates, and that's going to be the actual story moving forward. We're joined today by Christy Van On. She sits Van On and Company with market analysis. Christy, move it over to wheat. There were some numbers in that winter wheat seedings report that were uh, a bit of an eye catch for me. Uh, man, uh, just trying to sift through those numbers. It ended up being a positive day in the wheat markets overall. But you look at those numbers, what stood out to you with the winter wheat seedings and just the wheat picture in general after USDA's reports? Yeah, so wheat, um, as I'm scrolling through, and you know, like this report gives you so many numbers. So you're you're scrolling through everything. And I see like 37 million acres of winter wheat planted pop up. And I'm like, oh, that's a typo. And I keep scrolling. And then I realize it's not a typo. And you really did have 37 million acres, just shy, uh, 37 million acres of winter wheat planted. And that is three and a half million acres more than last year. And close to that, over three million acres more than the previous year. So there's a lot of winter wheat that got planted. And so it makes it that much more important that we're paying attention to your winter wheat conditions that are not great, right? And the big mm -hmm. question is, what do you see with those acres? Are you going to see them stay in winter wheat? Or are you going to have some abandonment? And I think that itself obviously was bearish. I think in general, you had some bearish information out of this report for wheat. But wheat is that like, you know, that type that does not want to be left at the party alone, right? It wants to be the fun one. If everyone else is having fun, it's going to have fun too. And so once you saw soybeans and corn both higher on the day, wheat really struggled to stay lower and able to work its way higher. What we did see out of, of grain stocks is we have 7% less wheat on hand than we had a year ago at this time frame. So, you know, that itself is, is friendly, but 32% more wheat being held by farmers right now than a year ago. And I think that's a key thing to look at if you are a producer is that we have this, this whole wheat logic that there's that bullish, you want to be bullish wheat. You see the news with Russia and Ukraine, you see the dynamics happening in the US, we have tight carryouts and you want to be bullish wheat and it's proven itself wrong over and over and over again. And now what we end up having is you know, a lot of wheat held on farms right now. And we also have that that same logic that probably ended up having a lot of winter wheat be planted on the bullishness that you thought could happen. And I'm not ruling that out. Wheat showed great strength today. This is a seasonal time frame that's great. 
The Russia-Ukraine situation is still a real crisis when you look at it, but we haven't really seen demand prove itself. Basis levels are nothing to be excited about. And it proved to us that there's a lot of wheat still sitting to be sold by farmers. And so that was a little bit of a disappointing factor when you looked at winter wheat, planted acreage, what we have on the farm right now. But overall, wheat, I have a feeling where you are as far as given the price of wheat right now, you're going to struggle to see that fall off if the rest of the markets are going to be able to rally. I think it's going to be a follower. Interesting tidbit about farmers holding wheat because I know corn and bean wise we have seen some increased farmers selling after the first of the year which is not you know that's that's typical we get a new calendar year we get new cash flows we start to see more of that farmer selling but it sounds like not a lot of wheat being moved by the farmer right now I just I, I think that is interesting compared to quarter beans right now Christy yeah you know for example when you look at you know obviously when or spring wheat you don't have a ton of it in minnesota you're getting a little bit more here in the central and western part around us and towards the dakotas but you look at north dakota and south dakota um they had a great wheat crop the yields for spring wheat were absolutely phenomenal some of the best i've ever heard in my career and so i think that you have that being held right now and you don't really have a cash flow crunch for producers you know mm -hmm. they have corn and bean sales that have been very phenomenal. You have corn and bean that they can sell right now for some great profitability. And so I think wheat, you're looking at it and you're saying, hey, I still make money at this level, but it's not great. The basis is terrible. Uh, I'm looking at a product that's well off of where I could have sold it in the summer. If I don't need to sell it for cash flow purposes, why am I going to sell it? And I think that's what's happening for that mentality. And that's why we're ending up with it not being sold like you've seen corn and beans being sold here recently. I don't want this to get lost in all the uh, USDA talk here today, but I know we had the consumer price index out Thursday morning. We also saw a dollar index under some considerable pressure on the day Thursday. I just wonder your thoughts on how some of that outside macro stuff did or could play into the markets here before we wrap up the week, Christy. Yeah, so interest rates are, are going to be a very hot topic to watch moving forward. You know, you've started to see CPI cool down and come in closer than like expectations. We're not seeing those big shocks. You're not seeing that. Um, and so the you're going to start to see that question of do they continue with the interest rate hikes or not? And the way they've stated it is that they do believe that you will continue to see some interest rate hikes throughout the year to get to a goal um, by the end of 2023. And, you know, that is still what's on the docket right now. But I think when you look at kind of this macro environment and what it could do, the big question right now is what happens to carries in the market, right? You know, mm -hmm. we used to have these large carries in the market. It was very lucrative to be able to put your crop in the bin, roll the contract here to some deferred contracts. We have not had that recently. You know, we've actually had the opposite where people have been squeezed for their HTAs at the elevator and you haven't had that carry. If interest rate continues to stay where it's at and we continue to have a crop that's not drastically tight, you know, you're not like panicking, you would imagine that you'll start to see these carries start to widen out. And that's what we're going to be watching is I feel like that is a talk that we're going to see a lot of. And if we can get through February with good crop insurance prices, it makes life a lot easier. But if you come in here and you hit a double whammy on producers with a, a falling market through February, and you don't have a whole lot of farmer debt, you know, they're operating loans right now, and you see that start to switch and you see producers start to pick up those operating loans, you're looking at eight to 9% on some of those. And that's not what we wanna see in this environment. So it's very tricky to be watching it. I think it's a key thing, but I think the biggest thing that could impact farmers uh, with the kind of the interest rates and the inflation side of things, what happens with the carry in the market? Do we start to see that grow? I would love to see those carries back to the market. It gives producers a uh, great opportunity to hold that grain and capitalize on a very short time frame of holding that crop. I didn't leave us much time for livestock. Real quick, though, uh, slightly lower cattle and hogs. I'm not surprised with the moves higher in the grains on the day. We mentioned some of those feed numbers as well, how those could factor in. Any thoughts livestock-wise, cattle or hogs here before we wrap up, Christy? Yeah, you look at cattle, you're near those recent highs. I think it's going to take a little bit to get through those. 
I think you still have some concerns on the economic side of things. Um, but you know, right now your main goal is to see if they can get through those recent highs. If you can get through recent highs, I think you you open up some big top side in cattle. But until you can get that, it's kind of that prove it to me mentality that I have in the corn market. Get me through 680 and then I will be more excited to talk about it. Same thing for cattle. Hogs have really struggled lately. Um, hogs have been all over the place. They've had these big, big swings in the market mm -hmm. and you're struggling here. Exports have been very poor for hogs. And I think that is where you saw the selling pressure today is that the exports just were not there. It was a big miss for them. And it was disappointing to see and you saw that selling pressure. The big question is you're now kind of at some levels that need to hold for the hog markets that we really haven't been at here for quite some time. Christy, great stuff as always. Appreciate the time. If folks want to reach out to you and the uh, team there at Van On and Company to get some uh, market help with the, their marketing plan, what's the best way to reach you? Yeah, you can call us at 1 800 648 5494. Fantastic. Christy Van On, she's at Van On and Company. Thanks so much for joining us as always. Have a great one. We'll get you back on the show soon. Thank you. That's going to do it for Market Talk today. Find us online, markettalkag.com. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.